beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Better rendered, the beginning of the good news of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And we're going to start with understanding a little bit about the gospel and its writer, its author. Now, it's part of the synoptic gospels. How many of you ever heard that phrase, synoptic? We're in our third week. Starting on the ninth verse of chapter 1. So please turn to the Gospel of Mark. I want to remind you that out of the four living creatures before the throne of God, each of the Gospel writers is symbolically represented there, and the Gospel of Mark is represented by the lion. Because if you'll remember, Mark is really writing down the stories and the teachings of Peter the Apostle. The Gospel of Mark is really Peter's account of what he saw Jesus do and say. Mark was his scribe. Mark was his translator, and he traveled with Peter. It came time when Mark uh, was asked to please write down what the Apostle had spoken of on so many times, and that's where we get this Gospel. And how many of you know that Peter was somewhat of a bull in a china cabinet. He was a forceful man. And he was, uh, spoke with boldness and force and power. And, and that's how Mark presents this gospel. It's a lion's roar in the face of an enemy. And so this gospel begins that way. It's the good news of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. That's the title, and that's what we're going to look at today. And that's what we're going to see through the baptism of Jesus and even the wilderness temptation. It's the galvanizing of that name, Son of God. Remember, this story starts with a roar in the wilderness, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of Jehovah or Yahweh, Jehovah's salvation, which is Jesus, Yeshua. And that voice is crying out to change a nation and to prepare a nation for God's great and good work of salvation that is finally coming to mankind. And so that roar comes forth. And it doesn't stop this freight train of God's kingdom and love coming into planet Earth continues as we start in verse 9. And it says this, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he, Jesus, came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heaven being torn open and the spirit descended on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased this word son of god is something that was on peter's mouth it was in his preaching at all times that we know jesus is the son of god do you remember when jesus asked who do men say that i am some said you're john the baptist some said you're the prophet some said this and peter said oh 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 You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Thou art right, Peter, but you did not have that revealed by your own understanding, but by Father who revealed that to you. Later on, uh, in Peter's epistle, we read that Peter said, And there was a time we were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we heard the voice of God say, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And so Peter preached the Son of God message that Jesus is fully the Son of God. And so when we come to the baptism, we hear Mark relating to us that Jesus came from Nazareth and went into the river Jordan. And as he was baptized, he came out of the water. And it says this, and I love, again, this is Mark. This is how aggressive and how assertive Mark is. He said that as Jesus came out of the water in verse 10, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. He saw the heavens torn open. I don't know what that looks like. How do you see heavens being ripped open? Now, maybe your translation says the heavens open, but the English Standard Version renders it correctly because it's schizo. It literally means torn asunder, torn open. And so as Jesus is coming out of the water, he sees the sky being torn apart and a voice thunders from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then a dove, the the spirit of God, descends upon Jesus Christ. That's an amazing 
thing. It says that he shot out of the water and immediately the sky rips open and a voice thunders, this is my beloved son. Wow, what a scene. It's reminiscent of Isaiah chapter 64 that begins like this. Oh, that you would rend open the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Well, guess what? He did. He did. I have to believe that the choice that Mark used to describe the event of Jesus' baptism as the heavens being torn apart, the one thing about something that tears apart, it can't be put back together again. You can open a door and shut it, but when you tear something open, that's it. How many of you remember when Jesus was crucified and he said, it is finished and into thy hands I commend my spirit. There was something else that got torn that day. The veil that between the holy of holies and the holy place, between the holy presence of God and mankind was ripped asunder. Well, on the day of his baptism, God ripped open and said, salvation is now here. Praise God. Something was happening. That Son of God, that's so important to Peter. And as Mark is remembering to write what was important to Peter, he knows that that term, Son of God, is essential. And so the thundering voice says, You're my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. How many of you know that that same voice was declared over your life? Well, the moment you accepted by faith the sacrifice of Jesus Christ... There came a voice over your life that declared, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. But I'm a woman, you might say. Well, it's a title of authority. Sonship is a title. It is a positioning in the kingdom of God. Just like men have to get used to saying, I'm the bride of Christ. Women get used to saying, I'm a son of God. It's a title, not a gender issue. It's a position of authority that when you are in Christ Jesus, you become a part of the body of Christ. And now you are accepted in the beloved. So what God says about His Son, He now says about you. And So there's a voice that thunders over your life. Others may come against it. Others may call you uh, different names. But remember the one voice that justified you through the blood of Jesus when Father said, I love you, and in you I'm pleased. Why would God be pleased with me? I've not done enough for Him. Why would God be pleased with me? Because the things I do for Him just aren't as good as someone else could do. He's pleased with us because we've accepted the sacrifice of His Son. And that's what brings the acceptance in the Beloved. Oh, so the Son of God, Son of God, Well, do you really think Jesus believed he was the Son of God? Let's understand something about what it means to be a son. Why would God choose to use the term son for Jesus? Jesus was not born. There are different groups. Mormons believe that God somehow had celestial sex and literally gave birth to a son. They believe that Lucifer and Jesus are brothers. But Jesus had a better idea. Um, And that's unbiblical and unfound in Scripture. Jesus is the eternal Son. Being a son does not mean you're inferior. Jesus was not created, but begotten. In other words, he issued forth from the Father. He is the Logos, the Word of God that came forth. And so he was begotten to us. He's the only begotten. He's the only revelation of the Father. He is the image of the invisible God, the light of His glory. So what does it mean to be a son? Why would God use that? Because there are three very important distinctions, classifications in sonship. Number one, the son is separate from the father. Now we know that there is only one God. There are not three gods, one God, but there are three persons within that Godhead. And so Christ, being the son, has a different function in submission to the authority and purposes of the Father. It's to reveal Father to mankind and to be the mediator for man unto the Lord. So a son is separate from the Father and unique, but yet has the same nature as the Father. 
Jesus is of the same substance and same nature as God the Father. We're human. He is divine. But Jesus took on a dual nature, being fully God and equal with Father. He found it not robbery to be grasped at, but emptied himself and became a man. And so he is both man and God. But a son is separate from the Father, but of the same nature. He is divine. And thirdly, he's an heir, not a servant. He is not just an anointed man that came with a very special message. He is the son. Hebrews 3 talks about how Moses was a faithful servant in the house, but Jesus was the master of the house. You see, a son inherited all of the authority and power of the father that was given to him. So it's unique term, son of God. Well, do you think Jesus actually believed he was the son of God? Maybe the church ascribed that to Christ. Many theologians today, I use that term loosely, say that Jesus did not think he was the son of God. We ascribe that to him and we read that in the passage. Well, let me take you to John chapter 5 verse 18. Let's see if Jesus actually thought he was the son of God. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So not only did Jesus declare himself to be the Son of God, but his audience understood him to be saying, I am the Son of God. Because the Jews wanted to kill him. Why did they want to kill him? Because he was calling God his Father, making himself what? Equal with God. A son is of the same nature as the Father. And so here you have Christ declaring himself to be a son of God, and the Jews understood what he meant. You think you have the same nature as God. Let's go on. John 10, 33 and 36. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to kill you or stone you, But for blasphemy, because you, being a man, there's that first principle of sonship, he's separate from the Father, you being a man, make yourself God. There's the second point of sonship that makes him of the same nature. Jesus responds by saying, do you say of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I'm the Son of God? Well, the answer to that is, yeah, yeah, they are. They're trying to kill you because of that very thing. They just don't agree with you, Jesus. And Jesus is actually getting them to admit it so that they are confessing that this Messiah whom God sent is not the Son of God. That's what he's saying. They're saying. And Jesus is saying, yes, I am. Twice they've tried to kill Jesus before they finally crucified him. And what was the reasoning for killing him? Because he said he was the Son of God. Now, if that's not clear enough, I'm sorry, I don't know what else is clear. Even his enemies understood that he was saying he's of the same nature as God by being the Son of God. That's an important announcement. That's exactly what Mark is trying to tell us. That Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus is not just a good man. Jesus is not a very special anointed man. He is the Son of God. God come in the flesh. Now there are those who say, yeah, but we know Jesus wasn't fully God because he was ignorant of some things. He didn't understand everything. And they use this verse. We'll see it later in the book of Mark. Mark 13, 22. When they asked Jesus, when will Messiah come again? When will you return? And Jesus says, well, no one knows the day or the hour. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Ah, see, if he was the Son of God, of the same nature of God, he'd have that information. Obviously, he's limited, therefore he cannot be God. What is misunderstood in this statement is this is not a definition of what Jesus knows and doesn't know. In fact, it's a Jewish idiom that Jesus is using. The idiom is this, that when the bridegroom chooses a bride in Judaism, he then says to the bride, I am now going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. 
And if someone were to ask, well, when will you return for your bride? Bridegroom, he would say, it is not for the son to know the day or the hour, but the father declares when I will return. He was simply using common Jewish idioms for a culture that understood that. It was not a statement of, I don't know. It was not a statement of ignorance. As a matter of fact, even in his answer, he elevates his position. For he says, no one knows, no man knows the day or the hour. So there is mankind on the first level. No human knows. He then goes on and says, the angelic realm doesn't know. And so then he puts himself, the son, above mankind and above the angelic realm, but still in submission to the authority of his father. And so even in his statement, he elevates the position of a son above the created realm of angels and humans and earth. So the son of God is an important title, and we see its importance on the day of Jesus' baptism. There are three essential public events that sonship is declared in Judaism. The first is the dedication in the temple. On the eighth day, parents were to take the child and they were to present their child to the temple for the redemption of the child, to pay back God, to give that gift and offering and sacrifice for the dedication of their baby. How many of you remember Mary and Joseph going to the temple? Remember, and who did they run into? Simeon, remember, who said, now I can die, I've seen the Messiah. You remember Anna, the prophetess, who declared and had been waiting. And so here comes baby Jesus. And they, this is where they pronounce his name publicly. And what name did they say? The name Gabriel's told Mary to give to him. Yeshua, Jehovah's salvation. Yahweh's salvation is being presented in the temple. And they were to bring an offering or a gift. And uh, they were to bring a lamb to be sacrificed. Or if they could not afford and were poor, they were to bring a turtle dove. What did Mary and Joseph bring? The dove. They had not, obviously it shows, shows you their economic status. They were poor. And on that day is a public presentation of the declaration of this child as a son of Israel and now unto the Lord. And so there's the first declaration of sonship. The second one is the bar mitzvah at age 12. And the word bar mitzvah literally means. Um, Son of accountability. And so when they bring that child to the Lord at age 12 to the temple, it is a public ceremony of their accountability to what? The law of God. Now, we don't have a story called Jesus' bar mitzvah. Mark doesn't even get into it. We start in Mark when he's getting into water. But Luke, Matthew, they tell us, about a time when Jesus was in the temple when he was how old? 12 years old. That was his bar mitzvah. They went up Passover time. It was time for him to go there. And where do we find him? Among the scribes and the Pharisees, right? And they are asking him questions. That's part of the ceremony of the public declaration of his sonship and accountability to the law. And he now becomes accountable and declared a son of the law in Israel. And so Mary and Joseph, this is a great feast. It's a great time. They're headed back home. You remember this? Right? And Mary goes, oh, wasn't that wonderful? This wasn't Yeshua beautiful, my little boy. I want to grab his little cheeks. Where is he, Joseph? I don't know. I thought he was with you. Joseph, where is he? I thought he was with you. I don't know. I ask everybody else, where's Je Yeshua? Where's Jesus? Ah, they panic. They run back. Where did they find him? In the temple, absolutely astounding the scribes and Pharisees for his knowledge of the Word of God. And his response was, I must be about my father's business. Now there is a third time of a public declaration of sonship, and this happened at maturity. And the word, and in fact, the number 30 and the age 30 in Judaism is Maturity. It stands for maturity. It is at that age that the Levites were now able to minister in the temple. It is the time when young adults or men who are fully come into their placement as men 
and could now operate their father's business or their father's farm or all that belonged to the father. They now had equal status with the father to make his decisions and declarations of his will. In fact, Paul talks about this as as how at one time we were all guardians under the law and that was the one schoolmaster who kept us till our adoption as sons of God. And what he's referring to is the adoption placement. This isn't someone like, like we were uh, without any parent and we got adopted in. This is the placement or declaration of a son over the authority of the father's house. The procedure was that it was a public meeting and the father would now bring his 30-year-old son before everyone and he would declare by laying on hands to his son and say, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Does that sound familiar to you? Listen to him. In other words, he'd go on and say, All my authority is given unto him over all that I own. He now fully represents my authority. That's, in fact, what took place at the baptism of Jesus Christ. When Jesus went into the water and the heavens ripped open and God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, He was declaring the sonship of placement of Christ to represent all the authority of the Father. Do you remember what Jesus said? Every word I speak is not my own, it is the Father's word. Every work that I perform is not my own, I see the Father doing it and I do it. It's because He's a faithful Son who has full authority and rights to perform the Father's will. And the heavens burst open and the Son of God, the salvation of God, came forth. And the Spirit now descended upon him, and he began the earthly ministry of revealing the Father to mankind. That is what happened in the baptism. That's why he is the Son of God. It is tremendous. It is awesome. Not only that, but he took his rightful position, and there was a cataclysmic shift in the priesthood. Because you had John the Baptist, who was a Levite, a Levitical priest. And it is at that time he's representing the Levitical priesthood, where Aaron was baptized, washed with water, and anointed with oil to represent the Spirit of God on him. But the true priest of God, the Son of God himself, entered into those waters. John said, you should baptize me. He said, no, this is by the right of God, what is righteous and essential to do, because the priesthood now was going to ship from Levi, an Aaronic priesthood, to a Melchizedek priesthood of Jesus Christ, the high priest of heaven. That's why, as in the temple, the veil was ripped for the presence of God now to dwell with man because of the blood of Jesus. At the baptism, the separation between God and men was ripped open by the baptism of Christ as the Son of God and the representation of the Father. And so we see it happen with power and authority. But I I love, again, the way Mark writes, and, and as soon as we're done with that, we go on in verse 12, and what does he say? The Spirit immediately, the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He doesn't put any flowery language. He doesn't, you know, I mean, Jesus just got baptized. The sky rips open. You hear this booming voice, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He rises up, right? Let's celebrate. Let's have some tea. Let's have some crumpets. Have some cake. Nope. Boom. Where'd Jesus go? I don't know. He's out of here. He had to go somewhere, didn't he? He immediately was driven by whom? Spirit of God. Where? Into the wilderness. Driven by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. And it says that he was there with Satan, angels, and wild beasts. Why? 
The wilderness represents the condition of mankind. The wilderness represents the opposite of the garden. This is the last Adam. This is the true Son of God who came forth to represent Father. Yet He didn't come to a garden. He came to a desert. And He didn't come where there were ministering angels to get at what He needed. He came to where Satan would try to deceive. He didn't come where He could name all the animals and the little bunnies hopping around. He came where there were vipers and scorpions. And the curse had done its damage to the creation of God. And let me ask you something. What was the one thing that the devil tempted him after 40 days of fasting and he was weak? What was the one question he repeated three times? I'm sorry, what was it? They didn't get it back there. Say it louder. We're back to that main issue, aren't we? If you are the Son of God. If I am the Son of God. Didn't you hear it? Didn't you see the dove come down? Isn't it interesting John the Baptist had the same question when he was put in prison? Right? Fear and doubt. Weakness. The enemy comes in. And what he wants to do is bring doubt. He wants to bring fear. He wants you to get to act on your own accord and on your own purposes or not act at all. Father just declared over him 40 days earlier, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The, the dove of the very presence of the Holy Spirit anointed his ministry and fully ministered unto him to go declare the Father and you stinking devil ask, if I am the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. Would it have been hard for him to do that? Yes, it was. Why? He had to be obedient. Now, it would have been nothing for him to do it. I tricked you into that question, right? I mean, obviously, it would be no, no problem at all to turn stone into bread. He, 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 no problem at all. But it would be impossible for him to turn stone into bread if he was an obedient son to the Father. For there was no revelation of the Father being given to the devil. Did he see the Father turn that stone into bread? No, he did not. Therefore, he would not. Do you see what was happening underneath all this? The devil wanted him to act by his own accord. This is what Adam and Eve did. This is where they fell. They became self-conscious instead of God-conscious. Jesus is anointed to be the revelation of the Father. And the, so, the, so the devil tries to come against his identity. Do you know how many of you have ever been afflicted by the devil who's been trying to come against your identity in Christ every day every day you are tempted to break your identity as a son of God and become Joe Schmo whatever your name is <laughs> gotta make a name for myself no you don't please don't make a name for him a name that's above all name God told Abraham I'll make your name great by blessing you, but you will be my witness. That's what God wants. His name great in us. But the devil wants to rob you of your identity in Christ. He wants you to think all who you are and what you need and what you should have and you don't have enough. Come on, Adam and Eve were in a garden. They could eat anything, everything. They had everything at their disposable. Disposable. Disposal. And they wanted one fruit. Are you kidding me? Why'd they want that one fruit? Because they couldn't have it. Who's to say they couldn't have it when God would want to give it to them? The point was this. Obey. What I love about this passage in the Gospel of Mark about the temptation of Jesus, it, it, it's like, like Peter. It's like, okay, he went into the temptation. Devil tried to tempt him. Okay, now he started his ministry. What happened in the story here? Ah, he beat the devil up. Let's go on. That's how much credit he gives the devil. How did Jesus overcome the devil? By speaking what Father spoke. Listen, we're all trying to find out clever ways to beat the devil and beat our flesh if we would just learn the Word of God. 
we could begin to speak our way out of all these temptations. Declare what Jesus does. Declare what the Spirit says. Stop trying to do this on your own and identify yourself. If you're the Son of God, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Just bow down and worship me. I think Jesus snickered. (laughs) Are you kidding? Right? He knew what the Father said. He said, jump off this this temple, the steeple, and and the angels will protect you. Don't tempt the Lord your God. See, Father was not saying any of this, but the devil was. How many of us listen to the devil instead of the Father? We need to have ears to hear what the Lord is saying. Again, the Son of God was de- the Son of God defeated Satan by being obedient to the Father in perfection. Now, in complete perfection, he stayed obedient. Now, what he goes on to say in Mark 1.14 is this. Now, after John was arrested, and see, you have a switch here, uh, again, in God's timing. How would you like to be John, right? You spent 30 years preparing for a ministry that lasted just about six months. What about my book sales? I was just going to put a CD out. John, Johnny B, was going to put a, a CD out of the, called Voice in the Wilderness. Man, this thing could have really been hot. What about all my, my family? What mattered was obedience to his calling. What if some of you have been, you've been lingering, you've been waiting, God, use me, use me. And what if God said, I've been waiting to use you. And in this one event, God wanted to use you, but you didn't show up because it wasn't big enough, it wasn't good enough, or you're complaining enough. Come on, be faithful. When God asks you to do something, you be a faithful son of God. John the Baptist spent 30 years in preparation. At age 30, when he became into the full placement of his sonship, he moved into being the voice in the wilderness. Six months later, it's time for him to get off the stage because one coming after him, he's not worthy to tie his sandals. Jesus now comes forward and it says this. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, the good news of God, saying the time is now. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. That is the introduction to the book of Mark. Son of God has come. And we begin to see His ministry. That's the importance of being a Son of God. I conclude with this. That because you've accepted Jesus Christ, you have been accepted in His Sonship. You now have become sons of God. The devil is going to tempt you. The devil is going to drive you into a wilderness. The devil is going to try to get you to lean on your understanding instead of his. The devil is going to try to get you to be self-centered instead of God-centered. He's going to try to rob you of your identity. He's been extremely successful over the church. The church is the government of God on planet earth. But we've forgotten we're sons of God. We've forgotten that we are joint heirs with Christ. That our inheritance is over all that belongs to Father. We've forgotten this. We think we just come to church and sing some songs. While the world goes to hell. And we've not stopped a soul from going there because... We've listened to the lies in the wilderness. No. Sons of God, it's time for you to take your position and your placement. The heavens were ripped open so that Christ would be the first begotten from the dead of many brethren and sisters. That we would be the body of Christ. Christ has called us sons of God. Father is looking for his people to begin to declare this gospel of good news. Turn from the ways of this world and come to Christ. That's our job. That's our calling as sons of God, that we would imitate the one who's come before us. Amen? Let's bow our heads.